greeting viewers. Thank you for joining us. We want to wish you a belated Happy New Year, and we hope that you are well and in great health. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi warmly welcomes both our local and global audience for the launch of our new series on reconnecting music, art, and trends in Africa. Highly demanded by Columbia University students, particularly those who are from the continent. Being positioned abroad often isolates individuals from their home countries in relation to culture and trends. But it's our goal to inspire a change by initiating this type of conversations. Columbia Global Centers Nairobi is part of nine regional hubs positioned around the world by Columbia University. The centers serve as platforms for dialogue and the exchange of knowledge in research, education, as well as public programming. We are delighted that you have chosen to be part of this broad network because we would not be able to achieve our mission without your participation. Today, we are privileged to have one of our closest partners, uh, the very talented and exceptional Anto Nioso. Anto Nioso is a musician, television host, radio presenter, who was named as one of um, 100 most influential Kenyans by Avance Media. A socially engaged artist and mentor, he has participated in a number of international workshops and conferences, such as the Mashariki Creative Economy Impact Investment Conference, Copyright X at Harvard Law School, and the Go Down Art Center Connect for Culture 2020. His debut album, Starborn, was released in 2014, and his sophomore album, Welcome to My Soul, will be out in 2022. Our moderator is one of our very own born and bred, Benjamin Momasi. Benjamin is a Kenyan senior at Columbia University, majoring in economics. He has an interest in entertainment within Africa and the African diaspora. On campus, Mumasi has served as the freshman representative and political chair of the African Students Association and is the current treasurer of the African Development Group. He has hosted several campus events such as African Thanksgiving and Afropolitan and moderated a political roundtable with notable journalists uh, Larry Madowo and Eromo Egubuje. Before we get started, kindly note, this program is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. As we proceed, please post your questions under the Q&A section. Remember to follow us on social media so that you can stay updated on our upcoming programs. Our handles are at CGC Nairobi on Facebook and Twitter, on Instagram, cgc.nairobi, and for YouTube, Columbia Global Centers Nairobi. I would now like to hand over the program to Benjamin. Welcome, Benjamin. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Pauline, and welcome everyone else to the webinar. Since we are talking about uh, reconnecting, um, and so I'd, I'd like us to you know, start by reconnecting to your roots. So tell us about your upbringing, uh, where you were born and where you were raised. Um, first and foremost, hi, hi, Mumasi. <laughs> I mean, you just <laughs> got right in. I went right into it. <laughs> I was born and raised in Nairobi. Um, but I was actually, most people don't believe that I was actually born in the slums of Nairobi, one of the slums called Kawangware. Uh, it's a slum close to one of the most affluent places in, Ke in Kenya called Lavington. So a lot of, and I went to Lavington for my school, so I think a lot of people thought that's where I was born, uh, in Lavington, but I was actually born in a slum um, and raised up in a very modest home. Uh, we're not like poor, poor. I mean, because my dad had a, like he had a record player, so we're not like poor. But um, a lot of music around my home, a lot of music in school, a lot of books, because my mom is a teacher, she's taught for more than 25 years. 
now she runs her own school. So that was sort of my upbringing um, and has sort of what has influenced my musical background and my sort of my literal literacy uh, in terms of who I am now. Okay, that's, uh, that's very interesting to know. And it's something not many people know about you. Um, you mentioned your having a record player in the house growing up. Uh, I'd like to know more about uh, the kind of music that was playing in the house uh, as you're growing up. Yeah, my, my, I mean, that time, my dad had a lot of old, I mean, it was a disco and I was born in 85. So before the 90s, I mean, as a kid, I think I, I usually consumed the music. So it was the disco era, it was the 90s pop music. I mean, we're talking from, from Dion Warwick to the Jackson 5s. The Jackson 5s to Greece, you know, music from Greece. So it was, it was literally everything. I think, I think it was my blessing and sort of my curse because I, unlike most people, I grew up in a household that had all types of music from Kofi Olomi Day to Vietnam. But anyway, um, so yeah, so there was, there was all types of music that I grew up listening to um, from, like I said, from John Warwick, Whitney Houston, you know, Jackson 5 to Luther Van Gogh's to African music, Billia Bell, Sukus, Kofi Olomide, Lucky Dube, that's the kind of music that I grew up listening to, which clearly played a huge role. In fact, the first one I remember singing through and through was um, Killing Me Softly. I don't even know how that happened. And it was the original version, but that's, that's a song that I, I, I think I remember singing the song and my parents looking at me. It was so vivid. My, my mom was by the window, my dad was slashing grass. And it was so vivid. It was like, is this kid singing or like what is happening? So that's that's one of my biggest memories of actually singing uh, to music and starting off. Yes, uh, as you as you've mentioned, it it's quite clear that uh, the musical influences that you had, uh, the music that was playing in your house while you're growing up, uh, influenced influenced your music. And you've mentioned that. Uh, you are singing uh, at an early age. And I'd like to know, like, when exactly was your, your talent for singing discovered? When exactly did you know that? And did other people around you know that you could, you could sing? So I was in grade three in primary school, um, but in Kenya we call it class three. And I remember we were meant to, we were meant to perform at, a, at an event where our headmistress at the time was retiring. And we were meant to sing, Jesus Christ is the answer. I think it's called Jesus is the answer or Christ is the answer, but I know that's the name of the song. So it was funny because I'd, I'd had that song before and we used to have a hymn book at home. Well, I was born Catholic, but we, you know, we used to have a hymn book at home and I'd listen to some of the songs. So when the teachers were trying to like teach us the song, the kids could only get up to verse one. <laughs> then I think <laughs> past verse two, I mean, we're in grade three. So people are just struggling and suffering. The harmonies were off. I mean, it's kids. And then, on the second verse, when they, were, they thought they were done teaching us the first verse, on the second verse, instead of teaching us, before they started, I started singing the whole verse. And I mean, it was so shocking for them. I'm like, huh? <laughs> like, what, yeah. what just happened? And immediately they actually decided, unfortunately for everyone else, <laughs> that I'd be the only one to sing the song. Wow. <laughs> so everyone else, like a whole grade, all of them were booted. So I ended up representing the whole grade because they realized, it's easy to work with one guy who can actually sing and who knows all the lyrics not being taught. And that's, I mean, at, at that age, I remember now one of the teachers preparing me by combing my hair, making sure my, you know, my sweater wasn't torn and, you know, knitting. I, I mean, the elbow was, was mm -hmm. torn by the sweater. So she, she found a way to knit it and put things together so I couldn't embarrass her or myself or whatever. And then I performed to, you know, to for on that particular day, and I, the crowd went crazy in the school. So I mean, that adrenaline, that dopamine—that was my first time I think to experience dopamine and realize, oh wow! So you actually feel this when you're performing, and that led to other performances. Because I mean, other people who are influential in society saw that. So not that particular performance, but later saw a lot of my performances. That's what made me end up performing for the then president Moi, and then. A cardinal Maurice Otunga, who's I think the first cardinal in Africa, um, the late, yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I knew them immediately, um, and we're talking about 1994 or five. I knew them immediately that yeah, I was actually born to see. Oh wow, that's a that's a that's a really really good story, and there's something you've mentioned uh, that has caught uh, 
That's caught me. And uh, I want us to take a, a little segue here. You've mentioned how you are being groomed by your teacher, like combing your hair. And something that is going to help us transition into the next question is, you know, things like hair, especially for like African men or like African men and women who have, like I have dreadlocks and it, it brought problems between me and my parents. I'm sure they're watching. Yeah. And you also have mm -hmm. dreadlocks. You've always had like long hair. Uh, what influenced you into uh, getting uh, dreadlocks and, you know, like being so, comfortable in, in yourself? So Mumasi, I think the first thing I tell you is, is one is to stop calling them dreadlocks and start okay. calling them rasta. Rasta. Because when you call when you call the hair on your head dreadlocks, what you basically do is that you propagate what the colonialist has done so successfully by calling the hair on our head dreadlocks. Because the point of calling that way was to say that it was dreadful, and okay. you know remember it was thanks to the Mau Mau movement that this particular hair style of hair actually became popular because then people didn't know about it, but they were in the fields in the in the, in the in in the forest fighting for independence and the hair was stamped dreadlocks by the white colonialists so that it could be seen as they are bad people and that same problem now has gone on to the police who when they see young men with rasta they decide that they are a menace to society so for me i always believe that words are important i'm not trying to say that you are wrong i'm trying to say that's where some of the thinking behind even your parents that oh you know you shouldn't have that but our forefathers had this kind of hair whether it was because that's what they wanted or because out of rebellion, this is the reason why I am able to sit in this restaurant and talk freely. You know, this is the reason why I can mention my former president and not look side if there's a secret service listening. So, but my choice of getting the hair was not as, as deep as I sound now. It was actually because my hair grows very fast. I mean, you can, you can see how long my hair is. Yeah. My hair grows very fast and I had to look for a reason to, to, I was tired of cutting, growing, cutting, growing. I was just tired. So I decided, I tell my parents, because I, I was getting a little bit famous. I mean, I was on TV, I was on radio. So I told my parents, oh, you know, guys, <laughs> I got a film and I'm going to be playing, I'm going to be playing a Mau Mau War veteran. So, yeah, so I have to put dreadlocks. My mom looked at me at the side, at the African eye of like, I was not born yesterday. Please, but I think she she knew I really wanted it, so she allowed. <laughs> so I think she sort of coerced my dad to believe it was true. The movie never came out, and he had the dreadlock, the rasta, and now more than ever, I re they really mean a lot to me now because the significance is bigger than the lie that I used to actually get them. Uh, that's interesting, and that's uh, a good transition into uh, my next question. Uh, you've you've mentioned how your your mom supported you in your. A rasta journey and you know yeah. normally uh, african parents do not like support music as a career uh did your parents reinforce your musical talents once they discovered you could sing and perform or did they expect you to treat it just as a hobby so i was i was only a bit lucky but though my father was very cautious i was a bit lucky because when i performed for the then president in 1997 um or on one of the grounds where i was born it's called Dorarua. Interesting enough, I mean, I grew up seeing my parents and seeing my folks quite political in the sense that the choices they made. So, for example, my dad didn't attend my performance for the president because it would have been seen that he was, I mean, he was clearly opposition uh, in terms of his belief. Um, so it would have been seen that he was part of the system. I mean, you, you don't want to be seen anywhere close to there. But that seeing me in the line like that way, sort of, I think, reinforce the idea that oh okay this guy is really talented i mean the whole nation i mean the president he'd been called to invited to perform the president's event and also i'll be honest i think they got a little bit of money they never told me but i genuinely believe that they got a little bit of money uh -huh. because when when I, I tell you i told i told you i come from the slums so when you get to grade four i think of grade five in kenya class five or five four or five you start to use um an ink pen, you no longer use a pencil in the writing, you know? So, I mean, if you make a mistake, you make a mistake now. So I had a Parker pen, while most people are using Hero. So Parker pen is like the bougie ink yeah. pen. And then I think I realized, hmm, because I asked for a pen, and then my dad brought home a Parker. I was like, I think this guy got paid for that performance, because <laughs> my life hasn't been too bad since. But my dad was very cautious. I mean, I was meant, let me, let me tell you guys, I would have been a piano maestro, because if I started piano classes when I was that young, I'd have been, 
amazing. That was some of the regrets that I have, but I could do nothing about it. My dad felt like he wanted me to take it slow because he'd been advised for me to start piano classes so I could get, being a great musician, I could actually get better as a, as a you know, as a musician. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I would have actually gotten bigger or better based on my skills, but my dad wanted me to take it a bit slow. He, he was like, in fact, he would do anything for me if I cleared university. So I felt like it was also a bit cautious, but it's a very African thing. I mean, I meet a lot of parents who ask me that if what should they do with their kids who are talented or their kids really look up to me. So when they watch me on TV and they see the reaction or they see how they, they react around me. So they, they ask me, what should we do with our kids? And I think it's unfortunate that for African parents, until you bring money home, then they realize that your, that your talent is worth it. But then how will your kids ever feed you if you don't, allow, if you don't feed their passion? So that's all you gotta do, feed their passion and hopefully one day they'll feed you. And I mean, we, we, we parents teach young kids constantly what like certain values that they should, in, that they instill in them. Like, you know, take it slow, you know, as slow as you go, you, you will get there, uh, you know, one day, dedicate yourself, be resilient. But why is it when it comes to the art that you shouldn't be resilient there? You'd rather have a degree and be at home for 14 years, but everyone keeps saying, oh, my son has a degree. Every meeting, you know my son, the one with the, the engineer, you know, <laughs> but they don't want to say my son, the musician, only if you're bringing a lot of money. So I feel that those are some of the things that we need to change and some of the attitudes, and it's possible to change them. Uh, it, that's interesting. And what kind of advice would you, uh, because I think there's, there's something to be said about the sustainability of, of talent, especially in emerging emerging economies like and, and yeah. talk about kenya and how yeah. how can how would you advise parents to find the balance because not just parents but also upca- upcoming parents like me in the near future and some of the members yeah. of the audience i mean one as musicians I, I, it's it's a very it's a very good answer honestly but it's a very very technical aspects to it because it has cult- culturally and society wise there's a lot of things to deal with before we can be able to deal with the real issue here, which is the support. I mean, when you talk about securitization, for example, of intellectual property, will banks allow you to, you know, get a loan off of your music or your upcoming album, you know, that as your security. So culturally or, you know, just financially, they've never done it, you know, it's something, it's something new. I think it's all been done by Af- it's Africa Development Bank, the guys I confused you guys for. So only they have done that. So then we go to government, we talk about copyright, we talk about airplay on our radio stations and on media. It's parents can support, they can take their kids to studio, but the systems around them are the ones, that's what, that's what and, I, and, it, and the fear is palpable, it's understandable that parents are afraid that their kids won't be able to make it because of all this, the ecosystem that they see that doesn't work for artists. So it's understandable. So I feel for parents who are in places and positions of power and for young people who are in, who want to be artists, they need to get more skills. I have learned a lot about intellectual property. I have gone to conferences that I should have avoided or ignored on, you know, like I'm telling you, on emerging East African market, on securitization of intellectual property, you know, pushing banks to be able to take music and film and art, even literally an artwork that you've worked on and decide that this artwork is worth one million Kenya shillings, or it's worth a million dollars, you can get a loan off of that. So knowledge and skills, and a lot of this transfer of knowledge towards people who do not know is quite important. And I mean, I gotta, I have to big up CGC Nairobi for allowing that ecosystem, that environment for people to know more so they can create opportunities and create um, platforms for artists to be able to, you know, to, to gain out of their skill. So it's, for parents, it's to hold your kid's hand. I mean, hold your kid's hand the same way you hold your kid's hand who wants to be an engineer. When uh, it's 2022 now, we should no longer be talking about your kid wants to be an artist, support them. I mean, we should be way beyond that. And if you look at the amount of money, like there's, there's been research by PricewaterhouseCoopers that shows the billions of dollars and now we're pushing trillions of dollars that is in the ecosystem, in the music, in the arts, in the film industry, in Africa alone. Well, there's a market, there's an opportunity. Not everybody, I mean, not everybody has to be an amazing singer. If your kid can't sing, maybe you should enroll them to be an engineer. Maybe they should be a producer. Maybe they should be, we, we are lucky in great managers. We don't have great managers. I mean, we, we need accountants who can work 
in the education in the, in the sorry in the entertainment industry you know photographers let's talk about publishers who can publish who can document all the journeys of these great artists and make money out of it so there's all these people we've got radio presenters tv presenters there's all this there's such a plethora of people who work in the industry but all you gotta do is research ask and be intentional about wanting to get change okay um at this point uh, i'd like us to move on to your teenage years and and high school just talk, talk a little bit about your high school uh, with regards to the extracurricular activities you participated in yeah, so my high school was quite interesting i mean but by, by the time i i go to music club and my son i remember that time 2002 i think Spanish guitar by Tony Braxton was quite a big deal and I, and I love Tony Braxton. So I sang it in the music club <laughs> and everybody was in shock. <laughs> Cuz I have a really high voice so I'm like what <laughs> what is going on? And then that sort of I think imposter syndrome I think that was my first time with the imposter syndrome like ah oh, wait that does, doesn't mean I'm good enough am I funny like what just happened? Mm-hmm. So I actually didn't go back to music club and I was literally forced I was punished by the prefects. because i used to refuse to go for rehearsals i was really forced and punished to be in music club and represent my school because they knew that i could sing which means that i could sing most of the uh the songs in tenor one and get the school mm-hmm. awards and i still rebelled them against it but anyway but it was journey that I had to take so my desk mate was bn um, in fact the first day i joined after he was school on the first day of school m- my parent, my dad took me so early So BN and Mayana, BN of South East Soul, we were the first two students for the of our whole year, like we were the first ones to arrive in school and we literally gave people nicknames. <laughs> so when people are walking in, I mean being kids being yeah, we are we are we are 16 or something, we are making fun of everyone based on their height or their look, if they look like a cartoon character, we gave them names, some of them which are stuck till today. So I was close with him because we were actually just mates. so we used to challenge each other in terms of songwriting and you know sometimes we there's times he's told me now that the song that i wrote back then he's like oh I, there's that song you wrote i really feel like you to release that song or give it to someone so it was quite a my i spiritually enough my school was quite a musically um like bold and bold in school i don't know how that happened because when i got to school i when i when i was called up to the school they didn't call me based on my music results because music had been scrapped before i joined in primary school before I joined the high school so it was quite interesting that you know that that happened but also the same cast of music being scrapped was also scrapped when I got to form 3 which is now like grade 9 10 grade 11 grade 11 yeah um so the ministry or the government said that if a particular subject doesn't have more than 20 students it had to be scrapped off because of budgets so those two instances in primary school and high school taught me about how people viewed music and people viewed artists even just as young as they are like there's no mercy even for a kid in school who wants to pursue music so all these caveats all these expectations and all this you know just stuff so i mean that's what happened and um but music but i mean i went to all the functions i performed i had a music group called Ren- renaissance it was a rebirth I performed at most school functions. I mean I had a ball as far as music is concerned, but as far as mathematics is concerned, <laughs> God knows <laughs> I was not the same. <laughs> well, um well, uh you've mentioned uh, uh BN of of Saudi Soul and uh one thing is that uh Saudi Soul actually the the members also met met in high school. Um yeah. and yeah, it's interesting you could have been part of Saudi Soul right now. Uh, yeah, I could have because I used to I used to I used to rehearse with BL all the time. Mm-hmm. But also I have to be honest about myself. I mean I think they they know me more than they know me as as well as I know myself is that I I don't do too well in groups for one reason. Mm-hmm. I I'm not I don't like when people come late to like rehearsal when people decide that yo you know I'm not feeling this. I feel like I feel like you know guys need a break oh, so that, that would shatter me so the idea that people would break away from each other after forming such a formidable group I think I was I was anxious about that so I decided to just go and leave alone but there's a huge possibility that I would have probably been in that group Oh that's interesting and uh, what other like uh, what other people did you meet aside from uh, BN of course that influenced your your musical journey in high school So this is the thing In the, this is the thing about high school there's there's um an Italian high school so then 
I mean, before COVID, they used to allow uh, people to come to school and speak to students. So there's a lot of Kenyan artists who came to the school to speak to us and to inspire us. So there's uh, artists who came, I mean, but mostly gospel artists. But it's interesting that in the same school, in my, when I was in grade, I have to, grade nine, in grade 12, which is from four in Kenya, um, there was a gentleman called Kev. He was an amazing singer. Um, he went on to become one of the Coca-Cola pop stars in a group called Sema. In the same school, one class behind us was a guy called Brian Treyer, who is now part of an amazing group called Elani. Before we joined high school, uh, these guys had cleared. So when I was in grade eight, these guys had cleared their grade 12, which is the 12 from four. They are called Votaries, a very big gospel group that also schooled in Upper, in Upper Hill. There was also a filmmaker who was in Upper Hill, his name eludes me now, but he was also in Upper Hill uh, before I joined the school and the high school and the principal used to talk about him a lot. Um, so that, so there's a lot of influence just even in Upper Hill. I mean, you could hear how people are singing, how they are harmonizing and their journeys and what they went to do with their music after leaving school. So it was quite interesting. There was other artists like Abi Nienza, who is a great guitarist, a great vocalist, great African fusion artist who actually schooled in Upper Hill. So I'd hear stories about him and be like, oh my God, I can't believe that he also went to Upper Hill. There's a lot of people who actually, I don't know how that happened. Um, one class again behind us, a gentleman called Josh, who, was, who is now in a, in, in a big group also in Kenya called Amos and Josh, was also in the same high school with me. So there was a lot of, we didn't know we were stars or we would be stars, but there was a lot of influence around us to know that we, there's a, you feel, you feel like you're having shoulders with stars because you feel there's a, there's a thing, that, there's a je ne sais quoi about the people that you're around. So, yeah, so I mean, that's the influence that I had. But also, most importantly, that's when my influence with the Neo Soul began because there was a free to air channel called Channel O in Kenya. And it was a time when Neo Soul had started, the music had been, had been all over around for three, four, five years, but it was now getting to us. So the likes of Erika Badu, D'Angelo, Maxwell, Sunshine Anderson, I mean, the roots, people who clearly you can hear my, my influences when you hear me sing. So that's when their music, I started listening to their music and I started getting inspired by their music. And for that reason, you can, my name actually became Anto Neo Soul because people used to say, oh, Anto, yeah, the guy who loves Neo Soul. And then one time an MC called me up on stage and said, and when I was, give it up for Anton you so. And that's how my name came about. So that was my influence in music, as far as music is concerned in high school. Well, uh, you actually read my mind because I was going to transition into uh, the name Neo Soul, and you've given us a, a good explanation of how it came about, mm -hmm. especially from uh, what you were seeing on TV, as you mentioned, Channel O. And at the same time, after high school, you acted, yeah. you, you were an actor, you acted on Sugar with uh, Lupita Nyongo, and you also hosted other TV shows. Um, yeah. and then you transitioned into music. Uh, during or after acting, uh, what, what made you, you know, move back uh, into music? So I went to Uganda for my A-levels. I came back and I, um, you know, I started doing a bit of just hustling. In fact, I remember I was working in a publishing house called Story Moja, which is a great publishing uh, house in Kenya. And when I was uh, working in the publishing house, I... One time I was walking my cousin home, but then she was waiting for someone to, to give her script to, so the guy would go through the script and he would you know, tell her if the script was worthy or whatever. And then this guy, I used to wear a fedora hat all the time. So this guy called Len Juma, a famous casting director who, before then I didn't know, but he was also in Tomb Raider, like I didn't even know about him. So the guy tells me, yo, you have a very interesting look. Would you wanna be on TV? I mean, I was like 20, I was like, yes. Yes, yeah. when, when can I be? So he's, and he had a camera at night and he took a photo of me right outside of Hilton in Nairobi. Um, and people should not be shocked when they hear me mention these hotels. I was outside. I was not inside. Uh, I, I, only, I only got bougie now. <laughs> so I was never bougie before. So I was outside of Hilton, of the Hilton. And he took a photo. By the time I went for the audition, when I got into the audition, remember like my, like my experience in music club in, when I was in high school, I got into the room and the, the guys, they were, I don't want to use, I don't want to use, I don't know how it sounded if I say the word, but they were Asian. 
So they started laughing, but they were actually Indian. They said, and I was like, what is going on? So apparently they were laughing because they'd seen my photos and they already picked me for the role that they wanted. And that's how I ended up, that's how I ended up on TV, on a billboard, on a, in an advert for an orange, um, orange the telecommunications, just because of how I looked like, just because, I mean, I wore a fedora hat, fedora hat, you would never tell me to remove it, I wouldn't listen to you. So there was a huge lesson there in terms of being yourself, in terms of being authentic and just being real, like being comfortable in your own skin, that got me that gig. And then when I was, when I was just now after the gig, the same casting director was looking for someone who had a spoiled brat look. How I looked like a spoiled brat, I don't know. But I went to the audition and godly, I'm not lying to you, this happened. When, when I was being auditioned, he told me to remove the hat. He literally called the girls who auditioned me and told them, make sure he doesn't remove the hat. It gives him his character. And the hat stayed on and I got the role. When I was doing the role, when I was acting, it was a five, it was called Siri, a five season show. Um, one time an executive producer walks into stu- walks in on set and says, I'm looking for someone to be a copywriter at my, at my advertising agency. You're in university, yes, go get me a copywriter. Go get me. I told him, why should I go back to uni? And this show is about to end. I'll be, I'll be jobless. Let me come and work there. So I ended, that's how I ended up working in agency. And then I got onto the show in Siri. This is the funny thing. I was helping the production to audition people who are walking into the room so that, because I knew a bit of the script, so that it could be faster for them while they were recording. But funny enough, when they watched the clips, they saw me so many times that they felt like I had mastered the role that was actually helping people to audition for. And that's how I ended up on, on Sugar with Lupita Nyong'o. Hello, come on. I watched the award <laughs> Academy Award winners. Hello, yeah. Where is mine? <laughs> so anyway, so I mean, that's how I ended up there. Um, and then when I, was, I started working on my music, I mean, when you make a little bit of money now, you decide, let me put this money into my real passion. So I started release my first track that ended up on NPR in the States that, you know, made me sort of a bit more famous because guys were shocked that I could actually sing guys and see me on, t- on TV as an actor. And when I was being interviewed for that particular song by a TV presenter because it had blown up in Kenya, the, the TV bosses saw us and saw our chemistry and were like, you guys were looking for a male host, you need to be the male host. So that's literally been my journey. It's been a journey of a lot of lacks. Um, I don't feel bad saying them because I feel a lot of times people feel bad when they, when they show that they sort of had a, an easier ride than most people, but I feel like I prepared myself enough for those moments. But I had to also elbow myself into spaces where I know a kid from where I come from would never have been allowed to go. So yeah. Oh wow, uh, that's a uh, very, a uh, very insp- inspirational, and it tells us that you know you sh- we should always be prepared, and because we might meet these opportunities, and o- only when we're prepared is when uh, we can make them count. Uh, now, yeah, Mumasi, transition- just sorry, sorry, I, you said something. I, I felt like I had to, I had to interrupt you, but not only do we have to be prepared, but because I, I see a lot of people in school watching, is that you have to, you have to be. I love using the word intentional. You have to be intentional about what you want in the world. I don't know about chakras and, um, and energy. I'm not that guy. Astrology, I, I don't know how to explain it in those terms mm-hmm. to sound deeper than I could be. But like I said, you have to elbow yourself to positions and places that you feel naturally you shouldn't be there. When imposter syndrome comes in, when your anxiety just wants to rule over your life and there's a cloud hanging over anxiety, you need to tell yourself that those places and those spaces are meant for you. You cannot be apologetic for wanting to be better, to get better, to be in better places. So you really have to elbow yourself. And no matter what you're going through today, you have to remind yourself that tomorrow you have to fight for your space. You don't have to insult people. You don't have to step on people. You don't have to be toxic to make it to where you want to go. You can do with a lot of kindness and resilience, but you do not be apologetic for wanting to get better and be more and be better at anything that you want in this world. Wow. Um, now transitioning back to uh, Neo Soul, uh, soul music is largely attributed to uh, Black Americans, and you have also been compared to artists like Shaka Khan. Uh, how has your sound been received by African audiences? Yeah, I mean, it's quite already my voice. I mean, everyone who's in the room needs to go and Google me. <laughs> <laughs> then they'll be like, what? What is happening? 
So I, there was a Shaka Khan tape at home. Um, and I mean, so naturally for me, because I, I, I'd listened to the tape over and over. And I know some of you don't know what I'm talking about. It's a cassette, it's a tape, and I'd have to use a biro pen to rewind it so I could. I know I'm speaking in, in <laughs> gibberish. Y'all, I know y'all don't know what I'm talking about. So I used to, um, so there's this song uh, called Stay by Shaka Khan. So, I mean, as a young kid listening to that over and over, and I'd rewind the tape just to listen to that part. And it mesmerized me, like people would sing in such harmony and such. And when I look at the tape and I look at the, the, in, the, the booklet inside and I saw the, the years when the music was recorded in the 80s, so that really fascinated me. Um, but it's been quite a journey for me because, to be honest, a lot of times, the attention that I get in Africa only comes because of the attention that I get outside of Africa. And that's the thing about, you know, prodigal children or like, you know, there's like, if you, if you know the Bible, they talk about prophets not being welcome at home. So when I released Chipsunga, for example, I got onto NPR and I remember I was in Netherlands, I was touring in Netherlands and I, the, the NPR guys did everything to look for me so I could do the interview. They ended up booking me like in a Mercedes Benz to go to a BBC oh. studio. So I could do the interview I mean, guys, it was my first time. I was like, yo, this is how people, this is how superstars feel. I've never felt like this. So, Abdul Nanji is like, some of us look at says, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, all this, I mean, so this attention. And then when I was, if, if you check out Chips Funga on YouTube, you'll see most of the comments are from Americans, you know? So, and because they say, oh my God, I had this song on WSKJ and da 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 da. And I had to come and look, and you sound like Shaka Khan. You remind me of Rasan Peterson, Parason. I mean, all that stuff. So it was my influence, but I was also intentional. I really wanted to hit those high notes. And because of doing it over and over, when my voice was actually sort of building itself, was forming, I ended up being able to do so. But it's very difficult for the African audience to understand me completely. But I feel like every time I blow up here, every time I have a song, every time I have a video that we're talking about, there's always a link. I was from NPR or the Theta magazine, which I also ended up on. And then all of Kenya was talking about me. So, you know, so the idea that I was on a Theta magazine, maybe people say, oh my God, our very own was on a Theta magazine. So there's yeah. always this thing of our own people not, when they don't understand you, they tend to want to stay away from you. While I feel like the media in the West, when they don't understand you, they create spaces so they can want to know you more. I mean, look at Erica Badu, look at her sense of style. Look at her. Look at her, her, her fashion. So look at her fashion. Look at her, her style. Look at just look at all those things. Once you amplify what you don't understand, it becomes normal. It becomes something great. But then, who am I? I am not one to sit down and let, wait for people to amplify who I am. I walk into those spaces. I create the music. I will send the music. I will document myself. I will put it out there, and I will also create tables where people like myself who see the kind of music that I do can get a space and an opportunity on my radio show, on my TV show, so that we can be more of us and eventually we can be an army. So I think for now I call myself the general mm -hmm. of soul in Africa. <laughs> yes, I'd like to give a shout out to Mwalimu Nanji, my Swahili professor. Uh, pleasure to have you join us. Uh, Kari to, Karibu uh, Mwalimu, <laughs> say it in Swahili. Say it in uh, Swahili. Uh, karibu Mwalimu kwa kuwa nasi leo. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, my Swahili is still, is still good. <laughs> he knows. Um, Not bad. Okay, um, a few years ago, you were signed by uh, an American label, uh, Black Bohemian. Uh, how were you able to reconnect to your Kenyan roots and still deliver artistically for an American label? Yeah, so thankfully enough, the American label was formed by a Kenyan living in the States. So, I mean, his reason for wanting to sign me um, was because he wanted to connect. He actually wanted to connect to Africa through me. So he felt like working with a Kenyan artist would help him. It was just for one project, an EP, which was quite great. I recorded it in Tanzania, in Kenya. And I was also intentional about wanting to have a lot of Swahili in the EP and move around uh, you know, East Africa to create the music. So um, there was no pressure to want to be, uh, you know, sort of speak to the American audience mm -hmm. because now I feel like he also saw the wave. He saw the wave that was happening. Um, and I don't want to say the artist, that he wanted to sign before he signed me 
but that artist is a very big artist from Africa now. He really regrets. It's one of his biggest regrets. Um, but then that's that's how life is. Sometimes you snooze, you lose. But yeah. um, and especially now, and I think for the last couple of years, I haven't felt, and I think a lot of Kenyan African artists haven't felt the the pressure to want to engaging the American artists with the American audience is amazing because the American audience is in its millions and the African-American audience as an African will really elevate you because of the sort of that link you feel like you have with your people back home in the motherland. Um, so there's that and that support is very welcome, but there's no pressure to want to sound, you know, more American pop for you to make it. Look at Whiskey, look at Boy, look at Thames, look at, look at all these artists. Um, you know, Ira Star, who are authentic and the whole world now wants to collaborate with them for them to also get our market. And I think the idea that we also have such a huge market, we have a billion plus people in our continent, which is untapped. So it's to say authentic, but also wants to be a bit more international in terms of the sound and the quality. And that will definitely get you there. Oh, um, a, f- a, few, a few minutes ago, you mentioned how uh, most of your African audiences would listen to you after they found out uh, you were maybe in the FEDA or uh, interviewed by NPR. And yeah. more recently, you have evolved musically from your initial song, such as Chips Funga, to Closer, which is a more recent song, which you described yeah. as Afropop, and Sensimilia, yeah. which has Caribbean influences. How yeah. has this move to a more African sound helped you reconnect to your African fans? So it's not even to my, mostly to my African fans. I did it intentionally for me. The thing about artists that you do certain projects for audiences that you feel you want to get or your audience that first loved you, I did it intentionally for me. When you look at Closer, the intention was not only to just have a music, a, a song. One, I wanted to work with a Tanzanian artist to sort of get and understand why, how Tanzanians are able to create their own music without a lot of Western influences and especially without sort of an English influence. And he had to say that they really sing in English, they sing mostly in Swahili. So I wanted to understand how they're able to do it and create such big bangers. Um, but I was also doing the project so that I could actually have a music video that could have a very dark skin, melanated lady in the video. It was very intentional. So sometimes I not only use music, not, not just even for the music itself, but for the idea that I will have visual visuals to follow up with the music and end up using dark skinned girls, dark skin African women in the music video for us to continue to propagate that vision that these young, beautiful ladies also exist. It's very important for me because when I growing up, I mean I I may be just a bit, I'm not even light skinned, I'm just I may be brown, okay? But I all around me I saw dark skinned um black ladies all around me, all around me, all the time. But when I look at TV, where I also work, I don't see them and it didn't make sense to me, you know? So it, I just felt like it was important that I use the music and especially African music to then bring that connection between them and, and not to be that I was alienating light-skinned women, but to also say that they've also had their shine. So it's okay that we also show young girls and I have a niece. And I mean, the idea for me that I, my niece will grow up thinking that she's lesser than, and from her own people, because she's dark skin. So I had a huge problem with that. And I felt like I want them to see themselves. Because when I release music, I know they'll be played on mainstream radio, TV. I know they'll get PR attention. I know they'll be on blogs. So why use all that attention and not actually do what I've seen a lot of African-Americans do, which is like in Beyonce's your formation video, talking about police brutality, talking about New Orleans, talking about you know, her roots, I mean, or Creole roots, I mean, all this, it's very intentional. You can release pop music, and in my case, it was upper pop, and music that reaches a, a larger audience, but if your music will get a larger audience, then it has to have a larger benefit and a larger need and intention in them, other than just the dancing and the feel good. There must be something hidden that is so hidden, but it's also so obvious. Oh, um, I'd like to mention that uh, Closer has actually been on repeat uh, in, my, in my room and my, my roommate loves it right now. Uh, yes. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for giving us Closer. Um, yes. Now we transition to us as we near the end of my questions. Uh, there's recently been talk, uh, especially on Twitter, about the apparent dichotomy between Black Americans and Africans. 
as an artist, uh, what have your experiences been with regards to this polarization of black people? <laughs> when I saw that question, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing, because I know I'll be quoted for saying this thing. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> let me just tell you guys. I mean, okay, so first and foremost, there is a thing about being East African. So there's a story that I was told when, when you go to the fort of Fort Jesus in Mombasa, where the slaves were taken by the Portuguese, and I'm not, I'm not sure where East African slaves were taken, like where they were taken to, but in the, in the case of, my, of our people, for example, so what they do is they take, they would take some of the people from the village, they'd go and fatten them up and then bring them back to the people and tell them, you see how we fattened these guys up? If you follow us, <laughs> my people, if you follow us, you'll also look like these guys. So some of them willingly <laughs> were coerced to go and not to make light of slavery, but that's one of the stories you hear when you're in the East African coast and specifically in Kenya. That's a story that I know. Mm-hmm. Again, when, when I speak, it is not to mean that my people, and I'm not speaking for all Kenyans, that we do not feel or we don't see or we do not associate uh, the, the, slave, the slavery and the injustices that were measured on our people. But in East Africa, we really have that story etched in our minds. And it's really, it's not a note that we, you know, that we sort of circulate on or a note that we, our stories are based on. So I feel that especially when we meet a lot of African-Americans who sort of feel like either one we to have an understanding of where we come from or we don't, we take lightly that they are now the repercussion of the people who are enslaved they don't understand how we don't understand that this is a big deal, you know? Because a lot of, I think, East Africans will look at African-Americans as just black people. They're just African-Americans like people trying to call me, sorry. So there's this, there's this disconnect between just the ones who were left and the ones who went, and the ones who went here to mean that the current generation of African-Americans is the the generation that came from slaves. Their suffering and their existence now in America is not one that anybody would say is full of glam. It is not at all. Being African-American, being Black, we see the stories, we feel the stories. It is not a walk in the park. While for we Africans and some of my people, for example, in Africa, we view them as having to have a better life because they are already in Africa. So the idea that these people, because you see, we view them based on the stories and based on the movies we've seen, the same way that they view us as kings and queens and some of the things they've seen coming to America, some of the things they see in that geo. I have never met a king in my life. I do not know a queen. I don't, I'm, I, I don't have a story about I am the sixth generation from the king of empire of the Kikuyu. I don't know any of that. So <laughs> the disconnect is always, always comes from, and I feel a lack of empathy towards each other's narrative. I think that's the quote, is that African-Americans and Africans refuse to sit at a table and understand one another because they refuse to have empathy for each other's narrative. And each other's narrative is valid and is understandable. When Africans move to the States, they think they, they now understand that they are Black. When they live in Africa, they have never thought of themselves as Black. They know they have a skin color, but they don't see the Blackness within them, you know? The same thing when African-Americans come to Africa, Yes, the accent will sell them out, but we never see them as a bl- blacks. We see them as, yeah, you, you're too tall, or you're, you know, you're quite large or huge for an African, but whatever, man. You know, so that. And I feel if we understood and we found, and we found that, sort of, we found each other halfway, I think we would, we would be at a better place. But we also have to have honest conversations. I've been asked by a, an African-American friend of mine. She asked me, she told me that she's never gotten along with Africans in her state, but she always, it's easy for her to chat with me. And I said, wow, I don't know how to answer that question in its finality or in specificity because I can't speak for everyone, but there's a truth to not understand each other's narratives. So you're always at loggerheads and you always have prejudices against one another that will never get out unless people decide to speak the truth. Okay, um, so one thing before I, I proceed, uh, Professor Nanji has mentioned that the slaves from East Africa were taken to Asia, uh, Europe, the Americas, and the Middle East. 
And one thing you've mentioned, Anto, is uh, the perception of, you know, the life of an African in Africa and the life of a, a Black American in the U.S. and how those perceptions are also uh, causing this uh, polarization, if I may say. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I'd also like to add, like, my own anecdotal evidence is that as I was, you know, in high school, I went to high school in Kenya, and I, I remember in my history classes, I, I rarely, like, read enough about slavery or enough about, you know, the atrocities that the Black Americans were facing. So uh, such things have, have, might have, you know, also led to this. Um, yeah. yeah, you currently have a show on radio. And in that capacity, mm -hmm. you are able to have insights on your audience's interactions with music rooted in Africanness. Uh, these include Black or American, Black American or British, or Black American or Black British, African and Caribbean music. What is your perspective on your audience's interactions with these forms of music? So my audience, um, my audience loves, loves Caribbean music. There's a thing about Jamaica and Kenya. I don't know what we do to each other, but we love one another. I mean, mm -hmm. people say that if you go to Jamaica, it looks like Nairobi. The shops and the setup, we love one another. But let's remember the, the, the background of reggae music in Kenya. When they, they attempted coup, the mini coup happened in Kenya in 1982, the military that entered the studio forced the then presenter then to play reggae music while they were saying that they'd taken over the country. And so the president, who I performed for, but this was 13 years before I was born. No, three years before I was born, actually. Three years, sorry. So he ended up sort of banning reggae music. In Kenya, we say Chini Amaji, which is mm -hmm. basically under the radar, you know? He ended up banning the music. But the, so the music was used now as rebellion music as music for the opposition, as music to uplift the common guy in Kenya. The guy we call Wanjiko, that's the common Kenyan. So reggae music was used for that purpose. Uh, so I think Kenyans, for that reason, love reggae music very much. It's music that I grew up listening to. It's, it's very, and reggae music is very intentional. Uh, not dance all specific to reggae, the messaging and you know, the people behind it, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, name them, all of them. Um, so we love reggae music, my audience loves reggae music. My audience loves, um, I mean, that's the thing about British music is that although we were colonized by the British, but the British have never had a huge influence as far as music is concerned in Kenya. How, I don't know how that happened, but I mean, look at American scene is way bigger than any, Hollywood is bigger than anything else. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you rarely hear people talk about Tobe, Tobe Nigwe, Nigwe on my station, they will not ask for him. Um, you know, there's one of few ten songs that they want to listen to, um, but unbeknowingly to them, some of the big Nigerian artists were actually born or some were raised in Britain and they ended up making it big in, in Africa. So, yeah, but a lot of people want to listen to, I mean, African American music, people know me, I am the, I am the, I am the branch manager or the commissioner general of the Beehive in Kenya. So, hello, come on. I mean, people laugh, you know, and then also because it comes a lot of the scandals, you know, Kanye West and Kim Kardashian and the relationship and they want me to talk about that and, you know, and, you know, Travis Scott and Asa Rocky, who all, by the way, all African, all Kenyan men do, they, we don't hate, but we do not like Asa Rocky at the moment because he took away the love of our lives. So he's the one that got away with Bay, you know. This, this Rihanna forehead, I thought me and I would, you know. So Rihanna, I mean, so there's, we've grown up listening to them. I mean, when you look at way back, I used to watch with the Houston song over and over on TV. I'm your baby tonight, I'm your baby, whatever, do the woman. I mean, you can hear that I can sing it exactly. So that's what I used to watch and listen to all the time. So there's a huge influence on that. Luther Vandross is big in Kenya. So we have that, we have all the new age trap artists who are quite big here. And when they say things or do things, people have a conversation with them here, big time. And now it's not only just the music, but also the footballers. The issue, for example, with Zuma, the guy who slapped and kicked a cut, um, and he's been fined heavily by you know, West Ham, by um, his cuts have been taken away, the footballer. It's had a huge conversation here in Kenya about Adidas and its treatment towards its footballers when they misbehave. You know, when Kanye West said that slavery didn't really happen, you know, I mean, we don't talk about slavery a lot in East Africa, but we, trust me, it got the newsrooms buzzing. You know, Obama, Obama is our own. He is, 
Kenyan, for lack of a better word, because his roots are here. So naturally, we will follow up on anything that is said about him or against him. Lupita Nyong'o, I mean, she's the only Kenyan to win an, an Academy Award. So naturally, we will follow up based on those kind of reasons. Eddie Gadegi is Kenyan. So there's all these reasons that make us want to follow them. And apart from music, film-wise, um, you know, Swahili is used in Star Wars. They've used... Uh, They've used my Kikuyu language, language in one of the scenes, which was very bad. Not that Kikuyu wasn't bad. They used very bad words. I can't say what they said. But I think they thought people would never know. But there's, there's, that influence is quite clear. When you look at the barber shops in Kenya, you can, by the way, whoever knows Ludacris in that room needs to get Ludacris because <laughs> he needs royalties. They've used his haircut and his face in nearly every barber shop in this country. Nearly. I am not lying to you guys. <laughs> bow wow oh my god 50 cents like if when you look at the matatu culture matatu is the public service vehicle when you look at them kadi b ended up you know ended up going viral in kenya because she reposted a, a photo of of a matatu that was fully branded kadi b we still have conversations in kenya about who's bigger is it kadi b Nicki minaj is it Nicki minaj lil kim will smith thank you you stay smooth day. look at will smith i mean the his style for example I met, I met Michael Jordan's mother, um, I think it's Delores Jordan. I met her in Nairobi. I was, I was hosting an event, a cancer uh, event where cancer fundraising. And I told her something that I don't know how she's never been told in all her years of coming to Kenya. That when you completely sh- shave bald in Kenya, that style is called Jordan. Yeah. And the reason why it's called yeah. a Jordan is because of Michael Jordan. His head was always shaved completely to the scalp. So those influences are quite clear here. Even small things like, but for the British now it comes to the accent. Small things like you hear Kenyan say, a mate in it. Yeah, we like to we like to joke around. I, I know we're probably making fun of them when we do it, but it becomes a conversation here, you know, when you say mate or dude or in it, you know, my G. Some of these things, when you look at Friday, the music, the the, the video, when you look at Tupac, uh, Kenyans, when I was growing up, Kenyans say, some Kenyans used to say they're in east side or west side. You know, it's like it was a Premier League. So people didn't even know what it meant. I mean, I understood the East Coast and West Coast after I got older. But you can clearly see the influences that we still have till today. When Jada Pinkett speaks, Smith talks about August Alcina, <laughs> you should see the conversation that happens in Kenya. So, yeah, it's actually every August, every July, we start making fun of August Alcina mm-hmm. in July and with Smith. So it, it is what it is. Yes, uh, you, you've mostly mentioned my, the crux of my next question, but I'll still ask, mm-hmm. uh, ask it. Is it um, what, do you see, what do you see as the role of uh, music in African societies and what is missing for music to accomplish that role? The only thing that I, let me start with what, what is missing. The only thing that I feel misses as far as our music is concerned is the essence of why our music was in the first place. They wrote our music in the first place, our forefathers. In Kenya, for example, the British colonialists cut the head off of our forefathers so that they could dismantle our roots, so they could poison our roots. And the reason for that is because the elder people were not documenting the music, the messages, the myths, and the stories of creation through, they did not document them. So growing up, growing up I, had, I, I know some of the songs we sang as kids, but I don't know some of the most important things that they would have wanted to pass on to me because they kept the younger people, younger Kenyans for labor, for control, and for being able to set their agenda and sell their agenda. And they killed off the elderly so that our stories would never be told, okay? So there was that. And I feel that's what lacks in most of our music in terms of who will tell our story. It's good for us to dance, it's good for us to have a good time, but where can we say we come from? I mean, when you look at American music, you look at folklore music, and the stories that are told, when you look at the film and the West, you know, Wild Wild West, you know, and just those things that we talk about, that people are able to document because of being able to be given information. Who will tell our stories once we are gone? People will dance, they will laugh, they will laugh, but where will they know that they came from when they listen to our music? If the whole universe today was to be cut out or to die and our music was left, what would you say about the people who were left, what would, you, what would the music that we have now tell you about who we are as a mm-hmm. people? I mean, the likes of Erika Badu, 
does it way better than an African could when she does, when she talks about hieroglyphics and she talks about the Ankh and she talks about, you know, documenting and how people were, which is about the essence of 360. I mean, she really does it justice. So I feel that's something that we, that lacks. And yeah, I think I forgot the first part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the first part was the, the role of music in African societies. Oh yeah, so the role, the role, I mean, apart from entertaining people, but it, it must be a role of reminding us who we are. Um, you know, I say that I don't know about any kings and queens, but we are kings and queens. We are the king. I may not know them. I may not come from them, but I do know that my bloodline is of kings and queens. That's what our music must represent in its in its in its lyrics, in its, in the visuals that we see, in its representation of our women, in the respect that we show our women in music videos, in their identity, in their love, in in who we are as a people, in showcasing our sceneries and our flora and our fauna. That's what music must do for the people. It must replenish more than earbuds. It must replenish your soul. Okay. Uh, now we are in. Uh, I'd like to allow for questions from the audience. We have two uh, questions, and the first one is from Joan. Uh, mm -hmm. So, as a background for the the audience, Gengeton is a new new sound, a new Kenyan sound. And mm -hmm. so, Joan is asking, "Do you think Gengeton is here to stay?" The thing is with Gengeton, Gengeton will, will, will last as long as the Gengeton artists want it to last. People, and for those of you who probably wonder, what is Gengeton? So Gengeton is like, I'm sure you guys had Ragaton. Um, uh, you probably had Ragaton growing up a little bit of it when it also had moved into the American circles. And there's a, there's a lady called, is it Loopy or something? But Ragaton has been there. Um, so it's, it's what it is to, Actually, Gengeton is trap, is trap music in America. So it is the music that is from the hood, that is from like deep Chicago all the way in. It's not, it's not Bronx rap mainstream. It's the music. It is also the music from New Orleans. I, I forget the, there's a style of music where the guy talks and they're sort of making some, some sounds and, you know, he's, he's sort of making fun. You know, it's, it's here to stay as long as they want it to stay. And the reason I said is because when people don't understand who you are, and especially when you come from the ghetto like I come from, because digital music is music from the young people who are never given a chance to be played on radio, who grew up differently, a whole generation of people that was avoided and ignored. And when they came up with their music, everybody did not want to play it or understand it or love it because they didn't understand it. But the thing is that it came with the numbers. And like I said, what people don't understand, they want to share with them. So what these young people did is that they did something that I couldn't do when I was younger, which was that they came together and pushed themselves. That's all they did. And we had to love it because it was all over our faces. So I feel Gengeton music will not die. And as long as the artists decide they will keep at it, that they will push it, that they will be resilient, that they will stay consistent and stay relevant, it will stay as long as it wants to stay. And on to... Uh, thank you very much for the answer, Anto. Uh, the second question is, uh, what role can, from Edna, what role can music play in advancing social and political change across the continent? Truth. Music has to be used for truth. There's artists throughout history in Africa that have been able to, to do that and by speaking the truth. The truth is not palatable. It's not easily edible. People, it's, people don't like it, but it must be said, you know? I have a song called Slow Down. When you watch Slow Down, the music video, I talk about how young people get, you know, talented young people, and I'm specifically a footballer who represents me in the video, who ends up in crime because they cannot be able to, to make ends meet with their music. And so it's a challenge to young people, one, to not really engage in crime, two, to also appease them and, and really also call out the government. Where do you think these tags come from? They come from our kids who have nothing to be offered to by you guys. And then they get into a system, a prison system that will not help them, that will not rehabilitate them. So these cycles, we must talk about these cycles. But listen to Miriam Makeba, I mean, her time in exile. Listen to um, uh, Huma Sekela when he talks about Stimela. And Stimela specifically here is when he is dealing with the issue of the coal, the mine workers. 
was from Zimbabwe, Angola, Lesotho, South Africa, were not only facing injustice from the man who owns the mine, but also from his own black people in Southern Africa, from Mozambique. And Stimela is the train, but it's also the thing that gives them that hope that maybe something can change in their lives. So I think truth, truth plays a huge role in, you have to be truthful, Angela Kijo, you know, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of examples. There may not be as many now, but also we must also be on the passage and on the quest for truth. A lot of times the people say, but that music isn't there anymore. That's a lie. That music exists. The likes of Bad Kuti, who is uh, Fela Kuti's son. Uh, Femi Kuti is there, Eddie Kwainaina. Let me, let, me, let me tell you how. You know, when people, it's like when, we, when I, we really have to seek this, this truth because those artists exist and share them and push them and talk about them. That's how they go viral. That's how the message goes viral. When, look, look at this oxymoron or juxtaposition. It's actually an oxymoron. That's what it is. Eric Wainaina, a Kenyan, Kenyan musician, when he sang Nchi Akitu Kidogo, which means country of the little, to mean that uh, when you want to get services, when you want to go to a government office, when you want to, whatever you want, you have to bribe someone something little. You want a service that is meant for you for free, bribe somebody something little. He sang that song and he called the government and he was banned in most, um, in most uh, governmental, actually nearly all, because he's never been able to do anything for the government. But punishment has been meted on him. He didn't go to jail, nothing happened to him, but they did that, that systemic, they literally, for lack of a better word, they pushed him to the wall and have taken away his money and his opportunities because he sang against it. And we're talking about 2000 and something, 20 something years on the line. Most governments that came in still treated him the same way, even though the presidency changed. Recently, I think it was a Japan continent, that the Japanese commissioner or ambassador, or however they're called, no, it's Japan ambassador, it's can't be high commission, Japan ambassador, went to, <laughs> went to State House and performed one of Eric Wainaina's songs. And the president was standing there and clapping and cheering for them. They're performing a song by a Kenyan artist who isn't allowed anywhere close to the State House. I'll do what African Americans do. <laughs> yeah. Or that guy on TikTok. <laughs> there is your answer. So I mean, the truth is there, and the, the songs are there, and the music is there. I have a, I have a beautiful song in my debut album. You guys can go check it out. It's called Africa, and I sing about how they say Africa is a place of war, disease, poverty, and and I explain all these misconceptions that they said about Africa, and some of them are true but they're not entirely true about who we are. Africa is in a country, you know? So you can't say Africa is a country full of disease. Where do you get your diamond from? If we're all dying, you know, where do you get your, you know, where do you get your food and your produce from Africa if we're all dying, you know? So there's, there's that, those truths have to be said and you have to also seek them. Seek ye and shall find. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and that's, that's going to be a good transition to our next question. I hope I don't butcher this name. I think it's Mave. Uh, she's ask, uh, they're asking, what are your thoughts on censorship and cultural regulation of music? Uh, you've kind of uh, answered this, but just uh, expound a little bit more. I'm, I'm not for censorship. I'm not for censorship because then people cannot grow. I don't want to sound like I am, uh, I'm, uh, I don't take sides with any American politics, but I remember reading an article where someone said, one of the reasons why Trump was big was because they yeah, are the left. But because the left, when you went to the social media and you went to their uh, social sites and their conversation, they muted him out. They muted anybody who believed in him or any conversation around Trump. But he existed and his ideologies and he represented the common American and, and, and the things he says, people do believe in the things that he says. Even when we talk about the big lie, people believe in it. So by deciding that you don't want to, you want, don't want anything about it, it means that you don't know, you don't know what is happening on the other side of the tracks. So for me, even if not, even if for anything else, understand that there are people who are different from you are, and they believe in things that maybe you don't believe in. And as as people who can bring different aspects and understandings of, of the way we look at life, and it is okay to have different ideologies, different 
looks, you know, outlooks on life. So I don't believe in censorship because I, by saying by censoring people, it means that we don't give people an, an opportunity to allow us to grow, and we don't give them an opportunity to grow. Because then how how can you censor what you don't even understand? So I believe it's not okay to censor people, whether it's from a sexuality point of view, whether it is from an ideology point of view, whether it is from however way off track that they are, you must be able to listen to people. You must be able to allow to listen. And he, no matter how cringy or annoying or disgusting you think that particular idea of belief sounds, listen to people. Do not censor people. I don't believe in censorship. I believe in regulation. Uh, when it comes to kids, I mean, don't put any crazy content for kids. You know, keep the internet safe, you know, especially for kids or from kids. You know, as far as, you know, all those funny, weird sites and weird people on the internet, keep it safe from our children. But the rest, yeah, bro, do you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this is for, for the audience. I'd like to inform the audience about uh, Sal Davis, who was the first international Kenyan musician. And his top song yeah. is Makini. Yes, uh, ju mm -hmm. just go and check uh, Makini by Sal Davis out. Uh, that's and from it's funky. It's so funky, man. Oh, my God, mm -hmm. so good. Yeah. Yes, and on to another question, again from Joan. Uh, it's now elections period in Kenya, and artists are usually used by politicians uh, to push their manifestos. Um, how do you think uh, artists association, associating with politicians affects their careers? So I will speak this in general, aside from just artists, but let me start with the artists, so that's the question. I know some Kenyans have seen me <laughs> personally dance with politicians. I mean... But listen, this is what I believe, this is what I, this is what I say, is that the problem and the mistake we've made with politics is that we've made not politics a bloodbath and we've made it look like a, a cesspool that nobody should be a part of. The problem when we do that is that when we do not involve ourselves in politics, who then do we leave to lead? When everything that you do Everything that you're a part of is political. It is politics. The regulation of what we can and can't say online, the representation that we get from our politicians and our parliamentarians and the people in the Senate, you know, when we talk about the, for purposes of my Americans here, the Congress, we are, they are a representation of who we are. So when they make laws or break laws or deny us the laws that can actually allow us to grow, it is because of bad politics. And you know what they say? They say that bad leaders are chosen by good people who don't vote. So that's just the voting aspect. And you'll say, yeah, that's just voting. But also it means that you involve yourself in who you pick then. Because when it comes to the nomination process of some of these leaders, when it comes to the grooming of some of these leaders, when it comes to the conversations we have as young people in our barazas, in our small council meetings, in WhatsApp groups, and in Zooms, and the things that we say on Twitter spaces, we are grooming the next generation of people that we want. When you talk about intellectual property and copyright, they were literally about to ban cop some certain aspects of the copyright bill that would allow people to plagiarize our music and not get hefty fines on them or pirate our music and not get hefty fines on them. So when you don't involve yourself in politics, it means that you're okay with the repercussion of a bad political system. So you don't have to be a politician. You don't have to run with them. You don't have to post them, but be involved in whatever way, because also your voice matters and people get to listen to your voice. It is important. I mean, let's look at the, the certain times, for example, when it creates chaos. Look at the times when Chrisette Michelle performed at the inauguration of Donald Trump. There were all reasons, all one of, one of people who looked at it as a good thing, but some who looked at it as a bad thing, had reason for wanting to do it was she felt like she would unite the nation at that point. point. Maybe it was too early, maybe it was too late. I don't know. But it allowed people to have a discourse and a conversation around, you know, when also do, do we draw the line as fans and tell our artists what they can and can't do. So there is a lot of that. And we must allow people to be part and parcel of who we are. And like I said, everything around us is politics. When the gas prices go up, when you cannot watch certain things on TV, when your favorite presenter is removed from TV because they say something political or had an opinion, it is all politics. 
Yes, I'd like to I'd like to push you a little bit further with, with that question. Uh, what mm -hmm. do you think about specifically when artists align themselves with the politicians' manifesto? For example, mm -hmm. this is an example in the Kenyan context. There was an artist who sang the song Tano Tena, which means five again, implying that yeah. we should vote in the, the incumbent. Uh, what do yeah. you think about such such alignments? I, I generally think that they're okay. And I'll tell them on two reasons. One, personal belief. We cannot tell our artists that they cannot be human beings who can make personal decisions. Yes, they do have a repercussion on the people and what people feel like they shouldn't be a part of. We don't have a I don't, we don't have a dictatorial regime in Kenya for me to say that if I see you as an artist causing up to a dictator, a murderer, a genocide guy that you're doing about, we don't have that in Kenya. So I generally feel like there's certain moments when it is actually allowed. The only reason why the guy became unpopular is because the current regime began to become unpopular because of the, like I said, the hike in gas prices, you know, the hike in land prices, just hiking a lot of things. So people sort of again reminded him that he sang Tano Tena, he sang Five Again. So they were blaming him for the situation that we are in, but they voted for the current regime unanimously, or the majority did. So he's just a scapegoat. And also let's not, and, if, and let, let's be honest, if we use the same amount of energy that we use to castigate or to remind artists to not be a part of politician circle and their, and their manifestos, I wish we use that same amount of energy to call out politicians when they mess up in politics, when they mess up in parliament, when they don't have motions in parliament. If we use that amount of energy on them, then maybe we wouldn't be in the positions that we are. Yeah, the second reason is money, yo. I mean, politics is only the time when a lot of um, Kenyan artists make their money from performing on stage, from, you know, because to be honest, all they mostly do is perform on stage. So you find that the song is popular and uh, and people want to see you on stage, so the, the 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 presidential candidates or the candidates or the aspirants uh, will actually call you to perform on their platforms. So I mean, if you got a big song at the moment, um, and let's also, for example, in Kenya again, there's a song called Unvogable. These guys sang the song and Maji. They sang the song Unvogable just as their own song. It became a, a, an anthem, but it was used by the the guys buying them and Mwai Kibaki, the last president, the former president, Mwai Kibaki. And that is when we were sort of, for lack of a better word, we were kicking out President Moi, who was in power for 24 years. And they used that song in their campaigns. And Bogabo is a mix of Luo and English to basically mean that you cannot shake us. We are unshakable. And in the, in the song, they say, who are you? What are you? Who the hell do you think you are? Do you know me? Do I know you? Get the hell out of my face because, hey, I am unbogable. That's what you are telling the regime that was living after 24 years. That who are you? What are you? Who the hell do you think you are? Do you know me? So that, and, 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 and we only call them out when we're not comfortable with who they're standing with, but we cannot call them out for making personal choices. Okay, uh, we have uh, another question. This will be the last question from the audience. Uh, the audience before I ask the I invite the live audience if they have any questions um when comparing music uh Kenyan music back then which uh the genre is kapuka uh and the music that exists now in Kenya uh do you think there's a downgrade in terms of quality because of the increase in obscenity uh for for instance uh Kenyan gengeton has had uh, a lot of obscenity and the notion that sex uh sells so does that affect the richness of the con of the content put out to the public? Yeah. So um, the the content is debatable. To be honest, yes, there is a lot of there is a lot of obscenity. There's a lot of uh, vulgar vulgarity as far as the new age artist is concerned. What I this, from a musical point of view, the quality the quality I would say has sort of plateaued in terms of. We could have gotten better. I mean, we'll talk about the MTV African Music Awards in, in Africa. A lot of Kenyan artists won awards then. So we can also, we can say that, yeah, that happened. But when we deal with um, the Kenyan artists now, I, the generation then and what they sang, 
and the generation now of what they're seeing. They come from two different backgrounds and two different beliefs and two different influences. But to be honest, it's understandable why they're seeing what they're seeing. But yes, I understand that the quality isn't as great as it was before. But I can't compare and say which one was better. The truth is, I can, but I won't say it publicly. And the reason for this <laughs> is because I do not want to propagate the idea of eliticism, where I feel like I'm elite enough. And that's the thing, for example, that c- comes with copyright, um, where you don't, want it, you don't want copyright to be elitist, that only certain people or certain people in society can have a say on what sounds artistic enough and what doesn't sound artistic enough. And one of the things that was dealt with, by the way, as far as copyright is concerned in America, because when I studied, when I did, when I did a Harvard course on copyright, it was purely based on the uh, American constitution. And to do away with elitism, what they had to do was to do away with the thinking that any genre of music would be lesser than because certain people in a room or certain people of a certain class or standard decided that it wasn't, which would take away their copyright because it would mean that it was not creative works. So I refuse to go that route and, 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 and explain what I feel is better, but I will say yes, that the quality has changed. Is it, for, is it greater than it was before? No. But is it growing? I think it is growing. It's getting better. And the consistency, maybe. And now even the backlash that they have maybe on mainstream media or not being able to get onto African media has made them sort of look and redirect their energy to probably more less vulgar sounding music. Uh, thank you very much for, your, uh, for the answer. And I'd like to say that the last question was from Tasha. Um, now I'd like to invite the live audience if they have any questions for Anto. Hi. Hi. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak to us and just taking the time to, um, yeah, like talk about your experience and, and um, your knowledge in this industry. We really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to, you zoomed in. <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to um, touch on something you said. You said there was like untapped um, resources in Africa when it comes to like music um, on the continent. Um, and yeah, untapped talent. And so my question um, is, what do you think the states or like different states or the different governments can do to kind of like encourage um, not only music, but the, this, like the art sector to kind of thrive? Um, and yeah, yeah, like given Africa's um, history and everything, like it's definitely different from you know, America and the way music in America is um, like the importance music has in America. I feel like it's a different history in Africa. And so how yeah, do you feel yeah. like, yeah, so how do you feel like the states or the public sector and even the like individuals too, how can they encourage and promote the art sector? Yeah. So I think the first thing, thank you so much for your question. I think the first thing that we must do is we must bring back the music to the schools and bring back art. So we used to have art and craft, you know, we used to have woodwork, metal work. I mean, all this DIY stuff that you see, I don't see a lot of Africans engaging in DIY on YouTube because I feel like that subject was looked down upon, like, you wanna be a carpenter? You wanna be like Jesus' father? Are you serious? You didn't have a serious job. So, you know, I mean, our perceptions must change. We must bring the art, we must bring the creative arts back to schools so we can begin to, create a foundation and it says a huge message that we actually support and we endorse this at a young age. We need to bring it back. We need to tell our own stories in, in our syllabuses and bring up those African instruments and teach them to our people. So it must be concerted effort by the by governments. And I think, and the thing about Kenya, for example, we have, we have what we call a devolved government. So every government can, every, every state, as you guys call them, we call them here counties, can decide what their budgets can be used for the young people. We must bring back our art centers. I grew up watching, you know, seeing a lot of community art centers. People would go to sing and perform and create music and create dance and choreograph and just have fun as young people and, and, and do theater. We must bring them back. We must fund and overfund our, our, we must, like our thespians and our theaters, we must fund them. You know, so funding is important, reintroduction of the arts back to school, 
as individuals, please teach your young people, teach your kids the songs of your people, teach them the history of your people. They're even now available in books, on YouTube. Be intentional about what they consume because we can only go as far as what we want to put out there based on what we consumed. So that must be important. But also to you young people and myself, we must document these things for those who don't have the opportunity and the capacity to do so. We must document whether it is an Afri as an African diaspora, whether it is, it is as uh, a Black American, document these things, document your experiences, document the music you had from your mom, document them when they sing, record them, because only then will we pass down some of these things that we actually know. And I mean, that, that's from, that can only go, like I said, as far as we want people to represent us, but also, you guys are learning, you're in schools, you're in Colombia, you not, whatever you're studying, and like I said, the opportunities that are there, legislate, please create policies, create policy, paperwork, policy, you know, just where you can bring that back home and push to legislate, to legislate certain, you know, uh, things that you believe should be handled differently as far as the creative is concerned. So intention is important, knowledge is important, and legally, we must find ways and loopholes to change it. And, and just want to challenge you guys and tell you some of the opportunities that I was talking about, like in management, there's a whole lot of opportunity as far as management is concerned, as far as distribution is concerned, because we have great music from Africa. How can you distribute them as an African in the diaspora to reach a bigger audience for the people back at home, the music from the people back at home? How can you create better ways to manage our artists? Um, African festivals, there's, there's, a, there's African music that's all over. The opportunities for African festivals in Colombia and outside of Colombia are there. So all these opportunities are there. What are we doing to be able to see some of the gaps that we have and we can be able to create them and bring them back? How can we have, I've seen certain projects, for example, how can we re -re recreate and reproduce some of the old music, traditional music that we had from back then? Can we record the music so people can be able to consume them forever, for life? How can we do that? So those opportunities are there. But like I said, in point form again, legislation is important. Um, getting your hands that as far as managerial is, is important. Documenting this is important. And yeah, and bringing back the art to schools from the lowest level to the highest level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you. Uh, I'll invite Eustace to ask uh, the question. Eustace Modin. You know what is funny? His name means, <laughs> his name means the one who goes. <laughs> and here he's gone. <laughs> uh, Eustace, well, you, you may unmute. Uh, in the meantime, if there's a question from the live audience, Okay, we'll give uh, Eustace uh, a minute. And if there's no questions, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much, uh, Anto, for being part of this. And thank you for the live audience and the uh, audience that has joined via Zoom. At uh, this juncture, I'd like to pass it on to Lillian to wind up uh, for us. Thank you well, for having me, guys. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. That was Wonderful. Thank you, Anto. Thank you, Mumasi. That was great. I've enjoyed. I've actually been on through, I've remained engaged throughout, and I hope our audience were also engaged. This is wonderful. And Anto, we hope to uh, engage you even more and more. You have a lot of wisdom, Mumasi. Thank you for the wonderful job you've done as a, as a moderator. That was quite engaging and uh, quite orderly. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, our audience. For We are very, very glad that you always join us to these meetings and uh, webinars. We are very grateful. And uh, to we hope to see you in our next session of this series, as well as other webinars that are in the pipeline. And uh, to get uh, updated of what we have uh, coming up, please um, sign up and uh, sign up to our Facebook pages, our Twitter, 
our Instagram, LinkedIn, which have been shared with you. I've seen some of you have already um, followed us. We hope to see more of you. Also, we can share our MailChimp where we'll receive other uh, communications from the center. Uh, thank you so much. And I want to wish you a wonderful, uh, here in Kenya, it's night. I don't know, um, in New York, I think it's morning. So afternoon wonderful. There. Afternoon, yes, afternoon. And yeah. here in Kenya, night. So wonderful night and uh, wonderful day to all of you. Thank you so much and uh, bye. Thank you very much. Before, before you guys go, let me just show you a bit of Nairobi ah, at a petrol station. Maybe some of you have never seen, I've never seen guys over here. I'm extra like that. So I'm, the whole time I made guys switch off their sound so I could. So this is a petrol station <laughs> in Nairobi. On, on my, so on the right there is where the president lives. He's probably watching Netflix now or something. <laughs> but this this is this is a small area. This is a place called Dennis Street. It's in Kilimani for purposes of you guys seeing. And this is a place that I like to come for hot chocolate. So I think all the hot chocolate I've come for is the reason why they allowed me to to come here. And these are the <laughs> you see how we we love our African Americans. Look at who's <laughs> on the cover of that. Look at the new African magazine. What else did I show you? You see our African people represented there in our newspapers and, you know, and the problems that we're facing as Kenyans for in 10 Kenyans can't pay house rent. So, yeah, that's... <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> and, uh, and talk, what? I, yeah. I wanted to ask you, Anto, due to public demand, could you perform the yeah. chorus of Closer for us? That is The chorus of Closer. <laughs> you. Chia <laughs> Butila Bazuka, Kalewa, baby come closer. Gear up in my middle, Kalewa. Oh, 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 Bye. Thank you, Anto. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for always thinking of me, guys. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to see you guys in New York, hopefully. And whoever asks the question, I'm, I'm going to take them to Starbucks. So that's all I know. And <laughs> yeah, and spoil them. Whoever didn't ask a question, you're going to buy me at Starbucks, whatever I want at Starbucks. That's all. <laughs> They have had. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Mm. Oh, this is Bien uh, Bien Benu. Yes, Bien yeah, Benu. Uh, yeah, just before you go, I just want to say thank you again on behalf of ADG. I think we've learned a lot and uh, that was very inspiring for me. And uh, by the way, I'm the big fan. I'm, uh, I'm the fan of Closer. So thank you for performing. Oh, yeah, the Closer. Well. Okay, okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you're you welcome to uh, New York. Uh, when, when you get here, welcome, you're welcome to ADG anytime. Uh, we'll be uh, happy to have you again. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Awesome. And I, I, I thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the questions, for the emails. And I got to say, Mumasi, Bienvenue, and everyone behind the whole project, that you are a, an amazing group of young visionaries. And I have to applaud you for what you're doing. Do not feel like um, your efforts are not being noticed. I have to say that you guys are absolutely exemplary and way above your years and your time. So congratulations to you guys for that. And a big shout out to CGC Nairobi for making these kind of things happen. But a big shout out to ADG because you guys are doing what governments have been unable to do. So big and much love to you guys. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Okay, guys. Bye, bye, bye. Now we can go home. Bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>